Red button. Um, it's recording. It's recording. Sweet. Let me minimize this real quick. All right. Welcome to the fire and overheat protection lecture. All we see is L. Hi, L. It's funny. Okay. I'm seriously going to figure out how to do this at some point. Might as well just take that off. All right, so to begin at the beginning, welcome. I hope you've submitted your homework because I'm going to go directly after this class and go grade that. So if you haven't, this is your reminder to go do it at this very second. Multitask if you have to, that's fine. Um, too bad we can't play Kahoot because this one's a pretty good one. Maybe we should give it another shot. What do you think? Maybe I've got a better inter internet connection today. I think it's worse today. I think it's worse. Yeah, the yeah. video... The YouTube video, we were only getting like every second or so a new frame. So. It was even worse. It was like every 10 seconds. It froze yeah, on the shark for me. The shark froze on my screen for like a good, like, a long time. Shark for that McCraven was talking about? Yeah, and it was just there, but he was talking. And then it had to like re, re like reset. Ah, I don't know if it's mine or not, but my ears, who knows? How am I looking? The entire Wi Fi in general. I, I mean, we the, can all the see. The cameras things. are fine, but the screen share seems to only be about two or three frames a second. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Screen share usually always is delayed. I think screen share is fine. Oh, I need a faster computer. Is that what it is? Ooh, I just had a fabulous idea. Rixie, can I borrow your iPad? What if I played, what if I showed you Baby Shark? Like, <laughs> no, don't do that. <laughs> I'm gonna That's I'm cool on so many levels. Don't do it. I think it's mirrored also. <laughs> so oh, yeah. It's mirrored too, so we wouldn't be able to see it, like, the words, like, oh, clearly. Mirrored? Challenge mode. Is it mirrored? It no, mirrored. you're good. Oh, no, it's not mirrored. It's not actually. I think L's is mirrored. It's only mirrored for yourself. No, L's is not mirrored. No, you just I can't really see it. Seeing myself, um, mirrored. it's mirrored for me, but that's a self-view. Hmm. But we can read your thing, Hunter. It's Interesting. Only... So it's only mirrored for the your own camera. Well, also, it could be different with, like, a screen on a camera. It's backwards. Look. Mixed media. Ours, it's, it's good for us. Ours, ours is fine. Yeah. yeah. For you, it's mirrored. I can see that. It, it looks like the software mirrors it, but only for your own personal camera. That's oh, shit. Weird. Okay, well, <laughs> if, if it doesn't work this time, that's fine. We'll just we'll come up with a way. Thank you. So... Here, if you see this and we play Kahoot on this, this would be a lot of fun. <laughs> oh my god. Very sore, but it'll work. <laughs> oh my god. Like instantly during class this time, if I can log in and figure this out that quickly. But I'm going to try to make this happen. You're going to play Kahoot with me, whatever my daughter was just watching. Okay. <laughs> So, if you go to a STEM school, imagine if we went to like some poetry academy, this just, it would fall apart quick. Oh, God. Poetry academy? <laughs> poetry no, academy. Poetry academy, I'm fucking dead. <laughs> I, would give you, I would give you a, a poetry assignment. Be doing more writing. Kind of like my PhD. It's, all it is is self-paced stuff anyway. Okay, so let's talk about fire protection. I know you guys want to do this. Um... Can you guys hear background noise with my kid in the background? It to... sounds like banging spoons mm -hmm. around. Okay. It's okay. Hey, right. guys, we can hear you in the background, and I'm starting the lecture, so silencio. I don't know if they know what that means, but <laughs> <laughs> that means silence. <laughs> silence coyote over there. All right, so we're going to talk about all these things. Um, I'm going to give you the rundown on the numbers, and most of the numbers in this um, section are pretty important to memorize. and no. So two subsystems, we got overheat and detection, which is handy. Just know which ones have detection, which ones have <clears throat> actual suppression. There's a difference. Fire detection's on the DC battery bus because the first thing you do when you get in the airplane is turn on the battery before engine start. During engine start is the number one time I feel like a statistician. Um, I'm making this up, but I know this is true. I know this to be true because I've experienced it. If you're gonna have something hot, you're gonna have something catch on fire, it's gonna be during the engine start sequence. That's it. I've had more overheats and engine fires during engine start than any time in route. Only one, knock on wood, engine fire in flight. 
So fire extinguishing also on the DC emergency bus, which is always powered. So you could technically, you could walk onto this airplane with to no power on it whatsoever, start a fire in the back of the cargo compartment and that extinguisher would go off, technically. If you see FIDEX or FIDEX, F-I-D-E-E-X, at some point in between the CBTs and the slides and the homeworks, this acronym got all jacked up, but it's just FIDEX is Infection Control Unit and Extinguishing, I guess. It's a, like a Navy acronym that makes no sense. Okay, this stuff is pretty cool. It's been around a long, long time. This thermistor material and Inconel tubing. When I was in a C-130, the, my instructor, I remember he was like this old salty flight engineer. He told me that this has been around since the dawn of turbine engines. So like the Whittle engine, whatever engine they first had fire detection on that wasn't purely visual. It had ink and out. <clears throat> Sorry, does someone have a gentle beeping in the background? Because, like, it's really bothersome. It's not me. I hear no beeping. I don't I'm hear it. Crazy. It's in your head. Mm. Well, what we've done in most of my classes, we've all just muted our mics unless we're talked to, and then we unmute. So, that right, gets sort of a lot of the interference. Yeah. Then you know for sure it's me doing it if, if, if you still hear it. So, everybody mute for now. Um, unless you have a question. So thermistor versus Inconel. Inconel, this is when we play Jeopardy, if in some alternate reality, I could figure out how to play Jeopardy with y'all. This is one of my favorite Jeopardy questions because um, two wires surrounded by thermistor material, nobody remembers that later. If it gets hot, it basically comes to ground and sets off those current, uh, those enunciations that you get. I, some of you can't figure out what I'm looking at, what I'm talking about. This is like a cross section of one of the wires in the loops, which we'll, we'll look at in just a sec. So dual loop versus single loop. If I had a board behind me, I would draw on it. If I was, if I was super techy, I'd figure out how to draw on this thing. But if you have a single loop detection, you go into the notes section on iPad, you, there's like a draw feature. Gosh, that, okay. On the notes app. I'll put that on my list to figure out. That looks like some sort of weird balloon, right? That's what, sort of, what it, a loop looks like. <clears throat> a little closer, we can't really see it. There we go. Okay. And so if you do detect a fire with a single loop, the fire detection warning will go off. But if you're in the APU or the engine compartment, there's two loops and they're mounted in parallel. So they have to both agree, like if this one outside here malfunctions and the inside one uh, doesn't, the malfunctioning one could detect a fire erroneously. If this doesn't agree, both of them, then they won't give you the overheat warning on your ICAST screen. That's just a little bit more redundancy because if you do get a fire over or overheat warning on an engine or an APU, what do you have to do? Anyone? Eject, definitely. The engine fire switch light? Uh, push light. Yeah, you're going to have, yeah. you're gonna have to shut it down, and that's kind of a big deal in flight. So they make this double loop system that we're looking at here in order to um, basically provide you a, another layer of redundancy, I guess, so that you don't get as many erroneous warnings. Because these things, like uh, I think before class we were talking about, they can be maintenance intensive. Um, people bang around near the engine, things get damaged. So if they are damaged, if, if you take off and you don't realize it's damaged and you get this fire system fault, basically one of the loops is not working. You can actually fly like that. It can be emailed out to a single loop system, but you have to do a fire detection test at every en route stop. I thought that was interesting that Mesa's regs were the same as the Air Force's on that. So dual loop is in the engine, the APU, and along the fuselage wing bleed air ducts. If you have a bleed air leak, it's going to be really hot, almost the same temperature as the, as the engine. My dog always starts snoring at this point in the lecture, and it's taking this as an insult. Saying, shush, that might be the annoying beeping you hear because he's snoring like, huh, 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 in the background. Single loop detection is available in the main landing gear bays, and that's the only single loop detection. Um, here's what it kind of looks like. You get a hot, we used to call it the cooler section and the hotter section. 
Um, and this airplane, it's not so far forward, it's in the core. And then this is the low pressure fire de detection loops. They will be calibrated to two different temperatures. So basically they're set fairly, the tolerance is fairly tight. If they do go off and both of them go off, you're shutting the engine down. Something is wrong. Um, turbines are like if y'all own a sports car, pretty tight tolerances on things like that. Um, let's see, fire extinguishing. The biggest thing I want you guys to remember and the most important thing for testing on this subject is that engine fire bottles do not just blow themselves into the engine. That's a really big deal and it's a decision they want the human being to make. Has anyone done the CBTs? And let me see if I can see your beautiful faces. Um, Martin, tell me what, which fire bottle, or anyone for that matter, which fire bottle does blow itself? Is it the, the lavatory one? Uh, Is that the heat seal? APU. The APU, that's what I was talking about. So the okay. heat seal, like, so you got two engines, they will not blow themselves. You have to actually push the, you have to push the fire, shut down button, and then separately lift a separate plexiglass cover and push the fire squib button. So you've got to release the halon yourself. The APU, if you're on the ground, will blow itself. Okay, it won't blow itself in the air. That's only on the ground, right? Yeah. On the ground. If it detects a fire, it's gonna shut the APU down and five seconds later, it's gonna blow its own bottle. And then for the engine fire bottles, um, isn't there also the warning of like the low pressure? Like if it's, then you can use the other engine suppression system. So like if the left engine, you use all the halon and there's still an issue, you would use the right engine halon for the left engine. Exactly. So you actually will get the low pressure if you do blow one bottle. Um, like I've actually lived through this. I had to blow both bottles into my number three engine once um, and so in between what happens is it automatically ports to the other one so once you blow the one you want to give it a few minutes to see if it'll put itself out um, and save the other one if you have another emergency which would be really really bad um, but every company has its different procedures okay um, Let's see, squibs on a fire bottle. What you're looking at, I'll show you in real life in just a second in a picture. It's like a big metal ball. You've got this frangible disc, which is basically like a piece of glass. That's what I compare it to, or something really fragile. And this explosive charge goes off, makes an electrical contact, busts through this fran frangible disc and causes basically an explosion, controlled explosion because this stuff has to get quite a long way to get into your engine. So um, it's pressurized with dry nitrogen to 600 PSI. That's pretty explosive, okay? Once you blow a bottle into an engine, that engine is not usable until it has, goes through a massive inspection that costs a lot of money. And so for some reason, somebody was telling me, who was it? Um, Daniel, can't remember his last name. He was in my class last semester. He's a ramp agent for SkyWest. He said a pilot at SkyWest, first officer, blew one into an engine by accident. You have to lift, first of all, you have to hit the fire push light. Then you have to lift the guard and push to discharge. So I don't know how he did that, but he did. Yeah, that was, uh, that was on October West then, right before the TFR. When How exactly did this happen? Maybe you can explain this to me. It was I, I don't know, but I heard about it. <laughs> I heard about it too. I was like, you'd have to really go out of your way to screw that up. Um, but anyway, QRH directed only. Okay. If there's any indication of a fire after you blow a bottle and you, especially visually, um, as in my case, we could see the flame shooting out the back of the engine still. You just go ahead and blow that second bottle and Get the airplane on the ground. Here's what they look like in real life. I'm sure you saw this in the CBTs. You've got all these metal tubes where when the explosion goes off, they go straight through those metal tubes at high pressure into the engine and it sprays everywhere. It's a mess. Um, so here's what it does when you push the engine fire push switch light. Closes fuel bleeder, hydraulics, affected squib. So it arms the squib, shuts down the generator, and then the final thing that it does is it disarms the 
um, what is what is the word I'm looking at? Uh, the continuous ignition circuit. So there's another one on here. Disarms that continuous ignition circuit. When I ask you to list these things on your exam, yes, I want you to list all of these things and ICAST messages don't count. You're gonna get a plethora of ICAST messages. So when I ask you the seven things, <coughs> it's this slide plus the continuous, continuous ignition circuit is disarmed. <laughs> so that it doesn't relight itself. Did I, I have a question. Okay. For the last slide, mm -hmm. was that always like that? Or am I like just crazy? Are you I swear to God, I didn't, cause like I thought when I was doing the homework, it didn't look like this. So then I answered, I think a few questions differently, but now I'm looking at it, I'm like, it's, it's different. Is this like updated or is it not? Am I just, I'm just like going like nuts right now. You're way overestimating my motivation to update anything. No, I haven't updated anything. Okay, cool. Could have been looking just, at the APU oh. one because there's an APU fire yeah. one that looks similar. Yes. Oh, is it really? Oh my God, I looked at the wrong one then. Oh, okay. right, just so you know, when I am grading your homework, I'm oh. putting points in there when I see it's uploaded. I'm not actually going through every single one and correcting them. What you have to do, just like in class, you have to take my and compare it to your homework. So don't, just because you got 15 points, don't assume that all your answers are correct. That's my two cents on that. I did say is that. There really a sim, is there really a similar one? Like exactly like the same with like the cat, with like the, with yeah, the it looks really buttons similar. and everything and it says pushing this will. Yeah. Maybe back to that slide, I'm just wondering why, like what's the seventh one? Because there's five on the slide and then the continuous circuit is disarmed. Continuous Ignition circuit is disarmed. So that's what's the, what's the last one? Because there's only five bullet points. Oh, it's just on the generator. Do, 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 do. It doesn't say anything about. It's a great question. Fuel bleed, hydraulic, arms affected, uh, effective squid, shuts down generator. Hmm. Squib and illuminates the push to discharge switch. I believe that's the other one that I ask. Okay. Good question. Oh, so there might be six, not seven. Let me look. Let me make sure that when I make you a study guide, I'm going to put that one in there with the correct seven answers. There will be a study guide via Canvas announcement before the test. So before as far, our what's that? Before our final. Yes, before your final. I'm going to do you the service of doing that because usually we go over stuff in class during review, but it's gonna it's not going to work the same way with the Jeopardy and everything. <clears throat> so. Um, anyway, the squib fires when you push this button, so the, the pressurized halon discharges, and then you get this right engine squib caution message. APU fire protection has a dual loop system too, and there it is. It looks like that. It's a little bit smaller of a bottle. They're both charged with halon 1301. I don't expect you to know what that is or all the properties of it. Somebody once wrote me a research paper on Halon. It was a, uh, it's quite boring actually. Just kidding. Not really. Single squib with two firing wires and it works the same way as the engine. It closes the fuel, closes the load control valve, shuts it down, arms the squib and shuts down the generator. And then of course, putting, you have to push the bottle armed push to discharge switch light if you're in this in the air okay then you get the bottle low and apu squib cautions unattended fires on the ground the reason why they built this for airlines is because for some reason they run the apu a lot when nobody's monitoring it which is a crazy thought for me whenever our apu or gpc as the case may be was running somebody had to be babysitting it on the flight deck staring at the gauge to make sure it didn't catch on fire um, Apparently you run these things unattended. So it shuts itself down and automatically discharges on the ground. In flight, it just shuts itself down. It'll continue to burn unless you push the button. There's the bottle for the APU. Nothing you have to pre-flight. You can't even see it because it's so high back there. And then cargo bay fire protection. These are the numbers you gotta know for your quizzes. Three smoke detectors in the forward cargo bay and the aft cargo bay has two. Um, and of course you get warnings. I'll show you the panel here. Smoke in the cargo bay is indicated by these warning messages. 
the master warning lights smoke it'll say smoke and then you push the one that's illuminated all right so here's the thing you got two bottles they both discharge at the same time but one goes really fast and one goes over the course of an hour lots of quiz questions on that an hour about an hour so it says approximately 60 minutes but you know in the multiple choice it just says an hour so it depletes over the course of an hour to keep fighting that fire if you need to get on the ground seems like too long to me but i guess if you have somewhere you're over water or something um, and you've got to get back and fly back it gives you that time meanwhile your flight attendants are running around like crazy with the handheld fire bottles trying to put the fire out as well so um, basically pushing this button here will select the bay where it's discharging shut off the cargo bay heater so that you don't feed the fire with more oxygen closes the AC shutoff valve in the aft and arms the squib squib okay um, pushing it again discharges both bottle into the selected cargo compartment so heaven forbid you have a, a fire in both cargo compartments handheld I suppose <clears throat> all right these messages illuminate and this one again it's just saying the same thing there's a high rate bottle and a low rate bottle one goes immediately one goes over the course of an hour in the lavatory you've got the um, ceiling mounted smoke detector which we all know you're not to, you're not to smoke in an airplane ever in the waste compartment just in case someone does smoke and they throw a lit cigarette which would be even like insult to injury because you're not allowed to smoke in the first place if they threw a lit cigarette into the waste compartment then this will discharge and apparently it doesn't give you any cockpit indications main landing gear overheat detection is just a single loop it's right there that's what it looks like in real life when you pull the gear up and it's overheated it gives you a warning to slow down and put the gear back down oh and question if it sorry on the like two sides ago with the no, there's no warning on it um how like if there's no cockpit indication like how would we know if that lavatory waste compartment like if it had been used like how would you know to refill that one halon capsule um yeah i feel like the, the cockpit indications there are cockpit indications and the slide is wrong but i'm gonna have to look it up for you i'll write it down i have a feeling cockpit indication but there has to be like some indication that it was used yeah i feel like there is um i think the flight attendants could probably tell and that's how you'd find out but oh. well, let's say there was just like a temperature gauge on the trash can yeah that's like how you tell garbage yeah. out. <laughs> it's hot enough it'll melt that squib and it'll blow mm -hmm. that bottle yeah pretty sure it makes a sound so yeah i can like i can look it up for more details on that um, I have forgotten. On the overheat test, you have to do this once every first start, or if you have a malfunction of any sort, um, you're going to have to do it during flight too and test to make sure it's all still working. If you get this mo main landing gear bay overheat warning, it says gear bay overheat in a male voice. Um, that'll come with a triple chime. If you get a, so the fail test, can, it's self-testing all the time. If it does fail, it's going to give you a warning with a single chime, excuse me, caution, and then you get this. All of these things, if you do get them, you pull out your QRH and you run it and make sure you don't need to go land immediately, which could be the case. FIDEX control panel, this is your one button you hit to test everything and basically tests the entire system to make sure it's working. You get a fire system okay advisory message if it is. And then all of this stuff goes on. I give you all that. Do this every flight. Um, I probably might have to turn to the swap presenter view. Uh, is that gonna work? Right, take this down. All right, just to make sure these things run properly. So portable fire extinguishers have Halon 1211. Not that you're responsible for knowing what that is. Um, there's also, whoops, did we go all the way through it? Oh my gosh, we're almost done here. Um, there's also a water fire extinguisher that we got to play with a little bit. Um, 
there's certain things you do not want to spray water on, like oil fires, things like that. You want to spray the halo. You want to spray water on the batteries. It's like someone brought a laptop computer and there was. Yeah. Like if someone's if someone's computer's on fire, in the, in the cargo in the not cargo compartment in the passenger compartment, I think I wouldn't worry about it. I would just spray them with whatever I had handy. We actually we watched a video on this. They did a test for the FAA. Like, Halon actually makes it worse because it insulates it and it gets hotter or the water, like, cools it down and stops the fire. It's a very, very specific type of battery cell fire where one cell lights another cell in, like, in a series, basically. And mm -hmm. so, like, if your computer was on fire, you'd actually want to use the water because if you use anything else, it would potentially be light. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. I never never knew so yeah i mean you think about the things that might catch fire and flight probably something in the galley um who knows but usually we're good to go um i so the one question i do want to remind you to study on this is what what color those two walk around bottles are remember what colors they are green and red yeah and which one's which um green's the water red's the halon correct good job so just remember that, that's one of your quiz questions. Um, as far as your uh, warnings, they almost all come with a, uh, what you call it? Yeah, see, look at that. Smoke detected, not, you'll get the smoke detection, but you won't get but it was indication that the bottle blew. So that, I knew there was some indication in the cockpit. So typically if there's gonna be fire enough to blow that thing, there's also gonna be smoke associated with it. So. That's what I would say. So you get okay. the skateboard or aft lav. Um, and then the rest of them come with a smoke or a fire bell, which is the, the constant annoying warbling bell. Okay. Questions for me? Before Sorry, one more time. The study the colors of the- Fire uh, extinguishers, the walk around bottles. Okay. So let's, yeah, that's a good, Good call. Let's go review the important things real quick. No, okay. If you're taking notes right now for things that are on the quiz, know that the main landing gear has one loop and that the engines and APU have a double loop that's wired in parallel. The parallel is important because they both have to agree in order to send you that message um, and to illuminate the lights. And that's for both engines and the APU? Both engines and the APU have the dual loop protection system. Um, this is an important slide. The APU automatically shuts down. Five seconds later, it blows the bottle on the ground. In the flight, in flight, it just automatically shuts down. I believe I have an essay question on your final about this right here. So as far as, yeah, that's probably the only essay question that I ask you about fire protection. So, and this. This isn't necessarily a fire protection question. This is more like a general question. Um, fuel, bleed, hydraulic arms squibs, illuminates the lights, shuts down the generator. And of course you can mention that, that a slew of ICAST messages also go off. And then the fire bell as well. Number one thing to do when you get an engine fire and you're flying is not panic. Run the checklist. My humble personal experience with shutting down engines in flight um, and flying with a variety of different pilots who respond to emergencies different is that the people who were coolest and who ran the checklist, everything got done, nobody got in trouble, we dotted all of our I's and crossed all of our T's and it went really well. Um, I've had people that get really nervous and start doing things too fast and you almost have, then you're, you're dealing with your co-pilot who's ah, over torquing while you're trying to run the checklist and talk to ATC and it gets very, so if anything like this does happen to you in flight, or even on the ground, so you've got a bunch of passengers behind you you have to take care of. Stay cool, slow down, okay? Slow down. That's my two cents on that. All right, well, I am done with this particular lecture. Make sure you have uploaded your uh, homework. I'm gonna go through and look at the homework in just a moment, and I'm gonna stop the recording here. Let's see, stop recording. Real quick. Sure. For the uh, two walk around bottles. The green one is water. What is the red one? Regular Halon 1211. And I don't expect you to know the designations of the Halons. It is different Halon than in the engines. Um, slightly different. 
I don't know what that's for. Maybe it's just calibrated to a different temperature. I don't know. But um, so halon in the red and uh, water in the green. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? As far as fire protection, study your homework. Make sure you do the cahoots. I did share them all, right? You can all view them. Okay. All right. Let me stop this recording now.